Good evening and welcome to a brand new series of Have I Got News For You? A new set, new rounds, new ideas, all utterly rejected. In the news this week, William Hague's eagerly awaited Say No To The Euro campaign gets off to a shaky start. <laughs> Glenn Hoddle comes under more pressure following allegations that Eileen Drury may be having too much influence on team selection. And abroad, President Clinton has given much-needed advice on how to stay celibate for 27 years. <laughs> <laughs> on Ian Hislop's team, a BBC reporter who has survived such life-threatening events as a machete fight in Colombia, a missile attack in Baghdad, and a slight disagreement with Kate Aidy, John Simpson. <laughs> And with Paul Merton tonight, the man who's been described as Iceland's hottest geezer, Magnus Magnusson. <laughs> For a brand new series, an entirely new round one. All the questions coming uniquely from this week's news. Ian and John. <laughs> uh, it's Mrs. Thatcher's human rights advisor. <laughs> <laughs> um. Is it Pinochet or Pinochet? It is, it is pe Like the drink, pe Pinot Colada pe Shea? Is that it? <laughs> Yes, of course, I think somebody pointed out he's Irish, and it's O'Shea, and he's... <laughs> <laughs> I was worried about your foreign report. <laughs> what was he, he doing right? over here? Well, he was having his back done or something, wasn't he? And it? he was arrested. Yeah. He was arrested... In the middle of the night, a tactic familiar to him. <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. He'd been visiting Mrs. Thatcher. Had tea. Why are they particularly friendly? Because they're lunatics. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more of the... Um, alliance during the Falklands. Yes, apparently if, if Chile hadn't helped us we would never have won. <laughs> Which I don't remember at the time. <laughs> anyway, she wants him freed. Mrs. Thatcher's very upset that he's been arrested. Free the London one. <laughs> <laughs> and how did he describe Britain before he was arrested? Uh, he liked Britain, actually. He rather liked us, I think. Mm. And he liked our electricity system, of course, you know, 220 <laughs> volts, really, you know. <laughs> He described it as the ideal place to live. Did he Which really? Just as well. Well, he's, he's since he's going to be... Gonna be <laughs> and uh, what happened last time Thatcher went over to Chile, do you remember? No. Okay, I'll show you. <laughs> she was on a tour, a book tour, plugging your latest book. And the... And <laughs> 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 Amazing how he gets a spontaneous round of applause. <laughs> She's maintained her popularity over the years. <laughs> uh, this is the arrest in a London hospital of ex-Chilean dictator General Pinochet. Uh, the arrest has been criticised by Margaret Thatcher as at the outbreak of the Falklands War, Pinochet provided crucial help to her government. He told them where the Falklands were. <laughs> uh, Paul and Magnus, your chance to score. This one, didn't you? <laughs> this is poor old um, uh, Richard Bacon, is it? Is yes, that his name? Was his name? Who, um, is his name? Got uh, caught, yeah. or got, I don't know, did somebody gr grass him up? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> he just uh, happened to, to uh, have a, some trouble with his nose. Yes, <laughs> uh, and tried to cure it by taking loads of cocaine. <laughs> Uh, yes, they have had a bit of a history. Uh, well, Christopher Trace, who was the first sort of male presenter, didn't he have to leave because he was a divorcee? Didn't he get divorced? Back in the 60s when this was considered a, a, a high old crime. Well, Janet Ellis had to go because she was a single mother. And somebody well, else... got to do with Christopher Trace being a divorcee? <laughs> <laughs> That's like saying, well, would you like this apple? Well, uh, you have some porridge. <laughs> it's two completely different things altogether. It would means you like Angus get... hasn't a clue about Christopher Trace. It's not written on his bit of paper. Oh, I see. <laughs> Too long ago. Yeah. Unlike other question masters, he just doesn't know the answer. No. <laughs> Magnus, what about Christopher Trace? Tell us. <laughs> There's a word trembling at the back of my mind. It's past. 
Uh, what's your uh, take on TV presenters taking drugs then? Why do you ask me? I seem to remember the last time you were on this program, you actually admitted to uh, uh, what, taking hallucinogenic drugs that, in South America. Mm, that really, <laughs> really was in the course of duty. And there were, <laughs> there were 14 people around me of restricted size with pieces of string tied around their willies and... You only really thought they were. Yeah. <laughs> sound like Blue Peter a bit. It does sound like Blue Peter. Yes, it is the Blue Peter uh, drug scandal, so uh, well done to uh, Paul and Magnus. And here are your Blue Peter badges as a result. Oh, lovely. Oh, I wonder what, are these genuine? Uh, yes, obviously. Yeah, you know. You powder these up. <laughs> it says on the back, not suitable for children. <laughs> Yes, uh, Blue Peter's 40th anniversary was marred by the News of the World story about presenter Richard Bacon, who this week left the BBC under a cloud. He sneezed on his way out. <laughs> uh, they're not certain where the presenter got his drugs from, but it's rumoured that the Blue Peter Garden now has a street value of 200,000. <laughs> uh, thousands of copies of this year's Blue Peter Annual have been hastily withdrawn to ensure that certain embarrassing headlines would never reach the viewing public. So here they are. Uh, first, on page 46, we have uh, Stone Me. <laughs> then there's Richard Smiling Face below the words Pot It. <laughs> and on uh, page 8, the almost prophetic Blue Peter in the Snow. <laughs> so uh, at the end of that round, both teams have, uh, like Test Cricket, moved on to four. And so to the odd one out round, or as it's just been renamed by a BBC focus group, the unusually included individual amongst an otherwise connected triumvirate round. <laughs> uh, Paul, Tony Blair, mm -hmm. Robin Cook, mm -hmm. Germany, <laughs> and Jordan. That's the country of Germany, and Jordan the topless model. Sadly not living up to her reputation. <laughs> um, <laughs> Robin Cook's trying to pretend he hasn't got a beard. <laughs> But we know he has, really. Mm. Mm. We know what colour it is. Um, <laughs> it's pink. No, that's not true. Um, that's his hand, you idiot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> has, um, this, has Tony Blair just swallowed a raspberry mithy? <laughs> Here's Jordan. If Jordan dances with a very small man in a dance hall, can he not only not see where he's going, but he can't hear the band? <laughs> It's who's going to Bosnia. The Germans want to send an army, um, which a lot of Europeans aren't very keen on due to various historical uh, similarities. I should imagine Cook's been to Bosnia to say, look, we're going to get tough soon. And if right. we don't get tough, then we'll really get tough. Can oh. I just give you a small clue? Yeah. It's got nothing to do with Bosnia. <laughs> Uh, I may have to give you this. I think you might have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the answer is that they have all been involved in rigged phone poles, uh, apart from page three stunner, uh, Jordan, whose breasts were the subject of a genuine phone pole, uh, inviting Sun readers to vote for or against silicon implants, or as the Sun chose to put it, my boobs are in your hands. <laughs> Germany tried to rig the Eurovision Song Contest phone vote. Uh, this was for this year's entry by Gildo and the Orthopaedic Stockings. <laughs> Before the election, Tony Blair was the subject of a rigged phone poll for the Today programme's Personality of the Year, according to one Labour insider writing an article in The Independent. The key to rigging these things is to never write anything down. <laughs> Adding, oh bugger. <laughs> uh, supporters of Robin Cook were accused of fiddling a Sun telephone poll uh, before a cabinet reshuffle when a massive t 260 callers phoned to say that he should remain Foreign Secretary and 14 to say he should have bigger breasts. <laughs> Uh, Magnus, your uh, cultural icons are <coughs> Jeff Boycott, Nigel Dempster, Alastair Campbell, and Björk. <laughs> Boycott. Jeffrey Boycott. He, he's... <laughs> well, you've identified him correctly. <laughs> well, they've all been involved in public altercations, haven't they? Mm -hmm. uh, well, Björk hit somebody at an airport in the last year or so, a, a journalist, when she came off a long-haul flight. Nigel Dempster was... Um, he hit his deputy. He hit, he hit his after deputy. After a long lunch. Yeah. Um, Campbell, mm -hmm. everybody wants to hit. <laughs> so 
So you're picking him as the odd one out? Not necessarily. <laughs> Jeffrey boycotts the odd one out because only alleged to have hit somebody. Is the right answer. Ah! <laughs> uh, very well deduced. Of course, both of you could have been uh, featured in this odd one out because didn't you break uh, the Sunday Express editor's arm or something? No, he wasn't the editor. <laughs> Right, what was he then? Well, he was the features editor. It was, <laughs> it was a friendly game of arm wrestling. Right. After a long lunch. <laughs> and uh, he didn't let go, foolishly. Campbell hit um, a journalist from The Guardian called Michael White. Because Campbell used to work for The Mirror, and he was very loyal to Robert Maxwell, in much the same way he was loyal to Tony now. And Michael White, on the day of Maxwell's death, was sitting in the lobby going, bob, 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 bob. <laughs> Campbell hit him. <laughs> Have you been set upon much in the past? I'm always being set upon. You can't go anywhere with a television camera without being set upon, yes. Yeah, uh, I was thinking of Harold Wilson, actually. Didn't oh, Harold about Wilson. I didn't realise. It's very good, this programme, isn't it? Mm. You do, you do, you read the papers. And like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why didn't I think? Yeah, Harold Wilson. Reads the, he reads the inside blurb of your new book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. That's a fiver. <laughs> He didn't say he read any of the rest of the book. <laughs> I don't care as long as he bought it. <laughs> it, was, it was about seven minutes past eleven on my first morning as a reporter for the BBC that Harold Wilson punched me in the stomach while being Prime Minister. At that time it was my job to go and ask him if he was going to call an election. And um, people didn't ask Prime Ministers questions like that then. I had the tape transcribed afterwards, and it says, it says, Simpson, uh, excuse me, Prime, which is as far as I got. And then Wilson says, you know I never do these things. This is outrageous. I shall complain to the Director General at once about you. And then it says, Simpson, ah. Oh. <laughs> Good, all right. Um, you can have your points, whoever it was. It's <laughs> been so long ago now. Uh, the answer is that they've uh, assaulted journalists, with the exception of Jeff Boycott, who uh, never hits anyone, uh, ever, particularly girlfriends. Uh, defending himself in a courtroom in Paris this week, Boycott quickly lost his temper and shouted, Shut up, everyone's talking in French all the time and I can't understand. <laughs> Perhaps rather failing to grasp one of the basic aspects of French life. <laughs> Uh, Ian, your uh, hip dudes are uh, Vera Lynn, Dame Vera Lynn, Yehudi Menuhin, Dickie Attenborough, and Colonel Gaddafi. <laughs> You've just met Gaddafi, haven't you? He signed his book for me, actually. Um, did you read it? I did. It was <laughs> barking mad. <yeah. laughs> As indeed was he. Can I tell you about what happened when I interviewed him? Please. Just a few days ago, he broke wind all through the interview. <laughs> Very deliberately and very. <coughs> John Simpson, <laughs> news at. <laughs> That's where I'll probably be working after this. Um, and his eyes seemed to come out a bit when he did it. I, you could tell. And just, when we played. That's one, of the, that's one of the perks of being a dictator of your own country. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when we played it on the nine o'clock news, we, we d put the sound down so the viewers wouldn't be offended. Was it actually audible? It was clearly audible. <laughs> cameraman was very embarrassed, he didn't know how to phrase it to me, so he said, did you hear the colonel making noises? <laughs> I didn't hear him making any noises, he was farting too loud. <laughs> <laughs> That's not so, the answer um, though, is it? That isn't the answer, no, it has nothing to do with the answer. Unless no. you were going to concoct something that... Uh, he may be the only one of those four who, who does, uh, <laughs> while being interviewed. Menuhin looks as if he's a bad <laughs> He's kind enough to give a five-second warning. <laughs> <laughs> all right, give us a clue then. Yeah. All right, they all featured in the files of Scotland Yard anti-terrorist branch that were recently Ooh. revealed. Of course, Carlos. Carlos tried That's to right, kill yeah. Dame Vera Lynn as That's being right. the expression of British woman. Gaddafi's the odd one out. 
No, Gaddafi, Britain, Britain was supposed, was accused of trying to kill Gaddafi. He told me it was definitely true, so it must be. Anything but like. what was your thinking, Paul, to pick out Colonel Gaddafi? Well, because he certainly, he wanted to, Vera Lynn, he wanted to kill, he was that she represented Britain, bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. Yehudi Menuhin didn't like violin music. Richard Attenborough, he didn't like his portrayal of Pinky in the classic 1946 <laughs> movie, Brighton Rock. <laughs> and so Gaddafi, he didn't want to kill him because he, that's, that's, that's his mate. Is the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> there is actually another reason why Gaddafi uh, is the odd one out, which is that he suspects that he was on MI5's hit list, which is the right answer. Yes, they all featured on the recently revealed uh, hit list of Carlos the Jackal, with the exception of Colonel Gaddafi. When police raided the flat of Carlos Sanchez in 1975, they found weapons, explosives, and on a bookshelf, a copy of Frederick Forsyth's The Day of the Jackal, and so the nickname Carlos the Jackal was born, just edging it over Carlos the Cooking for One. <laughs> And uh, finally in this round, John, Jacques Delors, Bill Gates, <laughs> Bernard-Henri Lévy, and the Pope. Is Bill Gates going to be the is... new Blue Peter presenter? <laughs> <laughs> the Bill Gates photo is a clue. Well, that's Belgian. Are they all Belgian? It, Bill... it, was... it is a Belgian question. Yes, it's because Bill Gates is the only one who's had a running battle with Mr. Kipling over several years. <laughs> there are <laughs> This is one of these, this is the Belgian was, um, surrealists who would right. go up and push cream cakes into yes. fam famous people's faces and this is what they've done to Bill Gates there. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what they call themselves, the Situationists or something. They call themselves the Brigade International Patissière. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Pope's the only one they haven't yeah. monstered. Yeah. Monstered, put a pie in the face of. Absolutely. Put yeah. in the right answer. Ah, oh, well, well, well done. Well done. Yeah. And what is the French word for monster? Monstre. <laughs> no wonder you're foreign editor. <laughs> I meant two monster in the hislop sense of the word. Blague. Monstre. Uh, no, it is in fact entarte. <laughs> <laughs> it exists as a French verb uh, to Who shove cares? a cream pie in your face. <laughs> they do. Who does? Uh, French people. They're not here. Uh, well, there might be one or two here. Any know. French people here? No. Oh. Well, okay. <laughs> Thank you, that's actually my brother, but thank you. <laughs> How comes your brother's French? <clears throat> he was pretending, Paul. Um, the answer is... <laughs> pretending to be your brother or pretending to be French? <laughs> Angus was acting, a rare treat. <laughs> I'm going to give you this answer, this is the last thing I do. Uh, the answer is, well, there's always hope. <laughs> The answer is that they have all had cream pies shoved in their faces by Belgian anarchist Noel Godin. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, with, uh, with the exception of the Pope, who is nevertheless on his hit list. The pie attack on Jacques Delors in uh, Grenoble last year uh, came dangerously close to making the former EC president look interesting. Pie <laughs> attack. Yes! <laughs> 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 From the <laughs> And so at the end of all that uh, clowning around, it would appear that uh, Ian and John have egg on their faces, trailing as they are, 8-7. In the past, this programme has never been afraid to borrow, and by that I obviously mean steal, formats from other programmes. Uh, but tonight we're proud to introduce our very own original quiz, Master Brain. <laughs> First contestant is Mr. Paul Merton, a former civil servant from Tooting. <laughs> and your specialist subject, uh, we've decided, is the Star Report. And your time starts now. What did Monica Lewinsky initially believe these semen stains on her dress to be? Coconut. <laughs> uh, no spinach dip. <laughs> what remark did Clinton make during the notorious cigar incident at the Oval Office? It won't light properly. <laughs> No, it tastes good. Uh, how did Lewinsky greet Clinton when he was shaking hands in a lineup at his 50th birthday celebration? She kissed him on both cheeks. He was tiny shoelaces at the time. <laughs> I'll accept that. She grabbed his crutch, is in fact the answer. 
Uh, what does Kenneth Starr ritually do every day at 4 p.m.? Um, he f***s a goat. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, uh, a horse, sorry. Uh, I can't accept it. Drink a cup of Earl Grey tea is in fact the answer. Uh, who said in 1987... Uh, that would be um, a, a copy vending machine on the fifth floor of the BBC. I've finished, so I'll start with the next contestant who is uh, Mr Ian Hislop. A magazine salesman from Clapham. <laughs> uh, and your specialist subject is the life of Rupert Murdoch. Uh, Mr. Hislop, uh, you have as long as I care to give you on the life of Rupert Murdoch starting several moments ago. Age seven, uh, what was Mr. Murdoch's first money spinner? Um, a topless um, playground magazine. Uh, no, selling horse manure to old ladies. Uh, or I would Same trade he's been in ever since. <laughs> Why has an Indian court issued a warrant for Mr. Murdoch's arrest? Because they've got a really good sense of justice there. <laughs> uh, no, for showing obscene films on one of his TV stations. Uh, Peter Mandelson regularly dines with Elizabeth Murdoch. What is his role in Mr. Murdoch's bid for Manchester United? Um, to help it through. Oh no, he's meant to officiate as president of the Board of Trade. It's very easy to confuse. Uh, yes, it's his job to... When I saw that headline, it said Murdoch buys United, and I thought it just meant Kingdom. <laughs> what is Rupert Murdoch's first name? Um... <laughs> Satan. <laughs> no, Keith. Keith. Uh, why did Star TV, Murdoch's Asian-based station, act BBC World News? Because the BBC kept putting the truth on. Um, which is obviously pointless if you're a Murdoch-owned satellite. It was about China. They kept suggesting there'd been a massacre in Tiananmen Square, whereas Rupert knows perfectly well that um, all those people committed suicide <laughs> in an attempt to discredit the democratic regime currently operating in China. Yes, correct. <laughs> um, at the end of those questions, Mr Hislop, you scored a two. <laughs> Our next contender is a Mr. Magnus Magnusson, a quiz show host from Reykjavik, and your specialist subject, Mr. Magnusson, is obviously Mastermind. Uh, you have as long as you like on the subject of Mastermind starting now. What unpleasant fate befell the black chair in 1978 and 79? It was kidnapped. It was kidnapped, the first time by students for a ransom of £50. Yeah. Uh, what question did you get wrong on Quiz Ball on, in 1968 uh, that would have won the programme for Kilmarnock FC? What was the name of the American playwright <laughs> who married Marilyn Monroe? Correct. And who was the American playwright who married Marilyn Monroe? I had problems with that. Because all I could remember was the name of the surgeon who operated my mother's kidneys. <laughs> And his name was Douglas Arthur. <laughs> I can't accept that. It's Arthur Miller, in fact. <laughs> uh, one question in 1977 led to a viewer complaining that you had mistakenly given Christ's first name as Reginald. <laughs> what was the question? It was, a bit, it was a very reasonable complaint to make. It was a question in uh, a specialised subject on the life and works of P.G. Woodhouse. And the question was, what was Jeeves's Christian name? <laughs> Absolutely correct. And what was Jeeves's Christian name? Reginald. Correct. <laughs> uh, Mastermind has its own fan club. What's the name of its magazine? <laughs> Pass. Correct. <laughs> uh, which language did you most dread having to read as part of the questions? French. Correct. Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past was entitled what in its original language? <laughs> um, <laughs> are you ready for this? A la recherche de la tombe perdue. No, à la recherche de la tombe perdue. <laughs> and uh, at the end of that round, Mr. Magnuson, you have scored six points. <laughs> and so to our final contender, Mr. John Simpson, your full name, please. John Cody Fiddler Simpson. Mr. Fiddler Simpson. 
is the BBC World Affairs editor, and your specialist subject is therefore a Christmas cracker jokes. <laughs> Mr. Fiddler Simpson, you have as long as you can stand it on Christmas cracker jokes, starting... I've had enough. No. What's black and white and red all over? I think that was a nun that was knocked out. Oh, no, that was something else, isn't it? <laughs> I'll accept a nun chewing razor blades. <laughs> What's brown and sticky? <laughs> what a stick, is it? A stick. A stick. A stick. A stick. <laughs> How do you make a Venetian blind? Sand in his eyes. Sand in his eyes. Sand in his eyes. Uh, listen, I'm sorry. I, I really am sorry for everything I've done. You know, I, I, I confess. confess that. Whatever it is, I uh, confess Poke it. him in the eyes, in fact. Colonel Gaddafi was wasn't farting at all. Right? <laughs> what time did the Chinaman go to the dentist? Tooth I don't know. Tooth hurty. Tooth hurty. <laughs> that is... Doesn't, I mean, doesn't racism enter into this at all? <laughs> Never bothered us in the past. <laughs> uh, what's green, hairy, and goes up and down? Uh, gooseberry in a lift. A gooseberry in a lift. <laughs> what's pink, hairy, and hangs out your pyjamas? Gooseberry in a lift. <laughs> uh, no, your mother. <laughs> After which uh, momentous effort, it transpires that uh, Paul and Magnus scored the most and are therefore awarded an enormous one point, bringing the scores to 9-7. And now time for a weekly selection of half-baked headlines, including some, or not, from tonight's guest publication, America's favourite cigar aficionado. <laughs> uh, for that Monica moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's kick off with... A woman bit into chocolate bar and found what? A mouse. Mouse's head. A mouse's head, yeah. Uh, Cliff Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I once bit into a mouse's head and found a bar of chocolate, is that what? <laughs> Uh, what? No problem for penguins. Uh, waiter look-alike competitions. <laughs> Logarithms. <laughs> no, picking out parents is the extraordinary oh, revelation. Yes. Next, uh, Viagra workers want what? No. R rise. Uh. Got to rise. <laughs> Got to, isn't it? Is the well, right answer? Every sub <laughs> Got to be there. It had to be that because uh, they're down tools. <laughs> And lastly, do you offer what on a first date? Cigar. <laughs> Is the right answer. <laughs> Which uh, parting words mean at the end of this uh, sad episode. This week's Blue Peters are uh, Ian and John with eight points, whilst this week's Masterminds are Paul and Magnus with 13. And I leave you with news that on London's Piccadilly line, there's a nervous moment for an elderly lady as she realises she's forgotten to buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> news of Richard Branson's latest round-the-world balloon attempt reaches the Virgin Rail Commuters Club. <laughs> and after a rousing speech, Anne Widdicombe puts on a brave face as the podium gives way. Nice.